Donald Trump will receive intelligence briefings once he officially becomes the GOP nominee. The same Donald Trump who told the Russians about classified Israeli intel in the Oval Office. The same Donald Trump who tweeted an image of Iranian capabilities from a classified spy satellite. The same Donald Trump who showed the Japanese Prime Minister highly sensitive papers on North Korea at a patio dining table at Mar-a-Lago. The same Donald Trump who hoarded hundreds of classified documents at Mar-a-Lago. And the same Donald Trump who had his intelligence access revoked for it after he left office. So why is that Donald Trump getting access back? Joining us now, former National Security Advisor to President Trump, John Bolton. Really good to have you, Ambassador. Uh, let me ask you, um, why is this, why is it a danger to give him access to intelligence? Well, I think Trump demonstrated during his presidency and, and certainly in the handling of the documents uh, after his presidency that he doesn't pay adequate attention to safeguarding these secrets and the, the dangers, I think, uh, commonly known of uh, when they get into the wrong hands of not just revealing the information uh, itself, but, but risking the sources and methods that are used to procure the information. So I'm uh, somewhat perplexed myself that the uh, Biden White House has apparently agreed that he'll get these briefings. Uh, I, I don't think it makes any sense, and I think it uh, really puts whatever he is told at, at risk of being disclosed. So the Biden administration, according to sources talking to NBC News, has said that the reason they're doing this, this is because they want to maintain a semblance of normalcy in the campaign. So President Trump can't, former President Trump can't paint himself as the victim of uh, politicization, politic politicization. Well, good luck with that. I mean, let, let's go back to uh, uh, to the original purpose, really, President Truman had in mind when he first uh, authorized, I'm pretty sure it was Truman, first authorized uh, uh, giving these briefings to, to presidential candidates. It was to avoid a candidate saying in ignorance something that could uh, could impair the national security of the United States. So it wasn't to satisfy the curiosity of the candidate, it was to protect the overall national interest. Uh, you know, we had a hard time getting Trump to pay attention in many, many days of those uh, briefings. And when, when he did really pay attention, it was often because he wanted to keep a document or something that uh, from time to time he went on and leaked. I mean, I, I think if you're going to do these briefings, they ought to be done right. So I also disagree with some uh, former intelligence community people who say, well, if he's going to get the briefings, make sure they're pablum. Basically, I'm summarizing it. I, I don't like that either. Either give the briefing uh, the way it should be, or let's just dispense with it and let Trump say whatever he wants. So there are voters out there who look at Donald Trump's time as president during pre as president and say nothing really bad happened or they look at you know what he tweeted out or what he was discussing with the Japanese or what he you know told the Russians in the Oval Office or the classified documents at Mar-a-Lago and they'll say nothing bad happened no, there's been no effect of this you know alleged carelessness with uh, intelligence or classified uh, information why do you argue that they should take it seriously well, because the people who say that can't possibly know whether it's true or not. Uh, wh one of the things other governments do is keep uh, a better secret sometimes than we do. So being able to use this information, which they can put into an overall mosaic of what they're getting uh, from other sources, could well benefit them uh, in ways that the public uh, can't possibly know. And I would say with respect to whatever he showed uh, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, that's an ally of the United States. You know, we, we share a lot of intelligence with our allies. Trump's mistake was doing it on the patio of Mar-a-Lago, where, where his guests could see it as well. If you're going to reveal information uh, to, to an ally, do it strategically, uh, not, not just for the sake of showing that you know something that, that uh, the ally or your adversary does. That's the problem with Trump. He can't understand why it is that he should be constrained in talking about the information. So I guess I would say if the Biden administration is determined to let this happen, I'd impose conditions on the briefings. I wouldn't let any advisors in the room with Donald Trump. So if the information does leak out, we know exactly where it came from. And I wouldn't show him or leave him any documents or photographs. I'd just give a verbal briefing that hopefully could minimize the downside risk of, of him revealing something. If Donald Trump is elected again, what happens to NATO? 
Well, I'm I'm very concerned. I think he's bound and determined to withdraw the United States from NATO. I think uh, the the notion that he's somehow uh, uh, using this as a bargaining leverage to get other NATO members to increase their defense spending is wrong. Uh, thousands of people over decades, myself included, as a small part of that, have pushed our allies to spend more on defense so we could strengthen NATO. I think Trump uses the the failure of some of these allies to spend what they themselves committed to spend 10 years ago, not to strengthen NATO, but to weaken it. I, I, I think the risk of withdrawal is very real. And the Hungarian president, who's close with Vladimir Putin, Viktor Orban, is visiting Donald Trump at Mar-a-Lago today. What do you make of that? Well, you know, I first met Viktor Orban back in the 90s, right after the, uh, the, uh, the Warsaw Pact collapsed, when he was a young, small-L liberal leader of, of forces in Hungary. It's an amazing transformation. But honestly, his greatest sin uh, is, is not his domestic policies, which we can certainly debate. It's that he's betraying the Hungarian Revolution of 1956 by getting close to, to the Kremlin. You know, back then, his fellow Hungarians were fighting for freedom against the Soviet Union. Uh, and, and today, he has drawn Hungary closer to Russia, I think, uh, betraying them and really betraying the NATO alliance. That, that's, that's a problem. Imagine what he and Trump are talking about when they talk about NATO. You've been long saying that Donald Trump shouldn't get close to this guy. You were against him coming to the White House, but were overruled by Mick Mulvaney. Well, you win some and you lose some. That's uh, that goes with the territory. I, I just think that uh, the the way Hungary behaved in in uh, holding up along with Turkey the admission of Finland and really holding up the admission of Sweden to NATO was outrageous. Hungary, uh, as the Warsaw Pact and the Soviet Union were collapsing uh, back in 1990 and 91, Hungary was one of the very first countries, I think, the first to come to NATO and say we want to be admitted. Uh, Hungary wanted to join the Western European group of countries in the U.N. They, they knew what it was like to be under Russian domination. They wanted nothing to do with it. It's just another example of Orban not fully understanding his own country's history. Uh, Ambassador John Bolton, thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate it.